in the many discussions of the last two days a common element of the theme has been the nature of a transition it's as if the best that mind could develop has failed in the need for something greater and yet at the same time when mind fails and something greater is not yet available there is a passage in between where neither the power of the intellect can assist nor the new consciousness which is still developing in the indian tradition <coughs> it is called the joint sandhi between two yugas two ages two cycles of development Sri Aurobindo in a prophetic passage in Savitri describes this as an image unfolding with Ashwapati sees and it is revealed to him the unfolding image showed the things to come a giant dance of shiva tore the past There was a thunder as of worlds that fall earth was overrun with fire and the roar of death clamoring to slay a world his hunger had made there was a clangor of destruction's wings the titans battle cry was in my ears alarm and rumor shook the armored night in this description you see this massive destruction of the past and it is so massive it's as if worlds collapsing a thunder as of worlds that fall doesn't mean the world has been destroyed but it's the collapse of an entire civilizational phase and not just of a small cycle of a gigantic cycle and so the collapse is resounding clangor of destruction's wings titans battle cry alarm and rumor and throughout where is this happening in the armored night because it's the period of darkness of the kali yuga that is ending and in the midst of this at the same time something else that is emerging i saw the omnipotence flaming pioneers over the heavenly verge which turns towards life come crowding down the amber stairs of birth the flaming pioneers rushing down they are not coming in singles they are coming in groups crowding down four runners of a divine multitude out of the paths of the morning star they came into the little room of mortal life they are not the divine multitude itself they are four runners they are going to prepare for it and so he is very um, careful in his choice of words it's not as if suddenly wonderfully everything becomes magically divine there is a period there is a transition there is an effort there is a struggle there are stages out of the paths of the morning star you know what is the morning star venus and why is it called the morning star it's a planet which is close enough to the sun that you will never see it too far in the sky and when the sun is setting venus is perhaps if it's on the other side it's the last before the sun sets that you can see and after that with the sun venus also goes away but when the sun is rising just before the sun rises you see venus emerging and so when you see venus even though it seems like it's dark you know the sun is just behind and so that's why it's the morning star it heralds the morning that is to come and so it's not yet morning it's not going to be morning suddenly but the herald the signs will be there it's something interesting also the nature of venus and earth's orbit the distances from the sun and the speed of the orbital uh, path of these two planets are so coordinated in so coordinated in relation to the sun 
that if you were to map Venus every morning and just mark a dot, let's say you're looking through a window pane, you mark a dot. Where's Venus today? Mark a dot. Tomorrow you mark a dot. And from the same position, keep marking dots. Over a span of about, I think, one and a half years, you will see Venus make a pentagram. Perfect pentagram. And it keeps moving like that. Amazing. It's not by chance. There are more such extraordinary coincidences in the relationships between the planets, all of which point to some deep harmony or wisdom, intelligence, which has put all these together. And so, out of the paths of the morning star they came, and they represent that, the beginning of a new age, into the little room of mortal life. I saw them cross the twilight of an age, one age dying, and another age beginning. In between is this twilight. Not yet full darkness, not yet full light, somewhere in between. <laughs> the sun-eyed children of a marvelous dawn, the great creators with wide brows of calm, the massive barrier breakers of the world, and wrestlers with destiny in her lists of will, the laborers in the quarries of the gods, the messengers of the incommunicable, the architects of immortality. They're all different aspects of the work that has to be done, which they come to prepare. Into the fallen human sphere they came, faces that wore the immortal's glory still, voices that commune still with the thoughts of God, bodies made beautiful by the Spirit's light. Carrying the magic word, the mystic fire, carrying the Dionysian cup of joy, approaching eyes of a diviner man, lips chanting an unknown anthem of the soul, feet echoing in the corridors of time. That their action, their steps, do not have just a superficial impact, but a rippling impact that echoes down. High priests of wisdom, sweetness, might and bliss. Discoverers of beauty's sunlit ways and swimmers of love's laughing fiery floods and dancers within rapture's golden doors. Their tread one day shall change the suffering earth and justify the light on nature's face. And we have not dwelt in detail on, but you get the sense of it. The nature of a transition of an age, and especially of the nature of this transition, which is unprecedented. There have been many transitions, many ages, many cycles, many yugas, civilizations rising and falling. But the nature of this transition has no precedent because the best that mind can create has also given us powers which are so extraordinary that we have the power to destroy everything if those powers are held in the hands of the little ego. Meanwhile, as the mind's age collapses, these powers suddenly are thrown out into a chaotic phase. And the light of the new dawn is not yet. We are in the twilight. And this is the most dangerous transition. It's not the first time it has happened in the universe. There have been other planets, other civilizations on other planets which have been through it all. The passage through the end of the age of reason and the beginning of the spiritual age and the in-between chaos. But for Earth, it's the first time. And the dangers here are extraordinary. And it is important to recognize which part represents the declining phase and which part represents the ascending phase. Because the two are mixed. Sometimes in the very declining parts are the seeds of the new. But you cannot seize upon the declining part and say, this is therefore the new. The two things are so heavily mixed. And so it's extremely important to recognize what you should cling to and what you should let go of. <coughs> Sri Aurobindo warns about this. And he says the error that is being made today is precisely to cling to the things of the past which have 
exhausted their purpose. It worked for us for so many centuries or millennia and how can we let it go? If we let it go, we will fall into chaos. And so we try to cling to the very things which are breaking down. And we delay their breakdown or we get pulled into the breakdown itself. On the other hand, the things which are emerging are so subtle sometimes, so new, so different that we fear them or we do not recognize that they represent a positive development because they have not yet come into their own, they have not taken charge or organized their action in the world. One such which is in between is the structure of the internet. On the one hand it uses knowledge of the past but what it actually brings and represents a development of the future, a pure level of connection of the whole world. And while it allows for free sharing of information, of even knowledge, of a bonding at a deeper level, at the same time the past can seize upon the new tools and attempt to warp them to its purpose. To bind you further, to lock you into a kind of an echo chamber, to spy on you, to deflect your interests and manipulate you. This also happens. These gigantic conglomerates, multinationals which control information on the internet are all built on unsustainable economics. They are all losing money and yet they continue. And how do you explain it? You don't. Well, they cover it up by saying you are the product. They are selling advertisements, but it's not just that. There's a whole entrenched system which wants to utilize these new tools to manipulate you. Now, if you look at the information which you are putting up on the internet, whether it is Facebook or into your emails, which they now control, they can very easily profile you. They know exactly what you're thinking. They know your mood. They can precisely describe what's happening in your life. And through very subtle tests, they can make out what you respond to, what are your trigger points, and then feed you news which manipulates your trigger points to slant your thought process in a direction that they want. Okay, so I want to end with another passage from Savitri. <laughs> Keep in mind, we were speaking of the trans transition of an age, a declining phase, and you have to distinguish what you have to let go and not attach to. And the building phase where you have to recognize what are the centers of light and the values which you have to catch, nourish and strengthen. Okay? But in between is the squeeze when the darkness. When darkness deepens, strangling the earth's breast and man's corporeal mind is the only lamp. Corporeal mind, that's your little thinking surface, physical mind that says, what I see is all I know. When the darkness deepens so much that you can't believe anything, you can't trust anything, not even your physical mind. As a thief in the night shall be the covert tread of one who steps unseen into his house. One who steps unseen into his house, covert tread of a thief in the night. So you have the night all around. Who is this one? A voice, capital V. A voice ill heard shall speak, the soul obey. A power into mind's inner chamber steal, inner chamber steal. A charm and sweetness open life's closed doors and beauty conquer the resisting world. What's this influence he's talking about? You see, the soul obey. The soul here is the surface soul, not the inner soul. And the power stealing in is who is the true owner of your house, of your mind, body, uh, life? Your soul, the divine presence. And that has so far been kept out of the house and it enters and takes charge. And it commands and the surface person, individual soul obeys into mind's inner chamber, not the surface chamber, on the inside the light comes, awakes something, turns your thoughts in a certain way. And the life's closed doors, which are all your senses looking out, which have shrunk back in distrust, 
They open because of the charm and sweetness. The coarseness and crudeness is as if removed and healed. And beauty conquer the resisting world. And he continues. The truth light capture nature by surprise. A stealth of God compel the heart to bliss and earth grow unexpectedly divine. And then the promise after that. In matter shall be lit the spirit's glow, in body and body kindled the sacred birth, the birth of the divine presence within us. Night shall awake to the anthem of the stars, the days become a happy pilgrim march, our will a force of the eternal's power, and thought the rays of a spiritual sun. And when this emerges, when this presence and the new dawn takes, takes over, a few shall see what none yet understands. God shall grow up while the wise men talk and sleep. For man shall not know the coming till its hour, and belief shall be not till the work is done. And this is a glimpse of this passage, but it points to the saving grace, which is the divine presence within us, asserting itself, coming forward, taking charge and compelling our darkened or confused nature to a light and truth. If you look back at the last 2000 years, almost all of the great religions have foreseen some great transition. So great, they didn't know how to describe it. In the biblical tradition, there is this whole fire and brimstone and a passage through great difficulty. And then after that, the kingdom of God. God raises all into his own light, which is again misunderstood or distorted by the church interpretation of it, taking certain things literally, not recognizing their symbolic or deeper spiritual truth. In the Sufi tradition, similarly, there is the concept of, or with the Christian tradition, with it, the second coming, which is the coming of the divine into his own. In the Sufi tradition, similarly, there is this idea that after all that has happened, a great Sufi saint said, a thousand years from now, he said that a thousand years ago. So a thousand years from now, when man steps on the moon, Islam will rise to its highest and then fade away. And that would be the time of the Imam Mahdi, the one who will bring the light and establish the truth. You'll find in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, you have the Dalai Lama who incarnates to lead the people both spiritually and politically. And there's an ancient prophecy that says the 14th Dalai Lama will be the last. Interesting. And you wonder why. And the present Dalai Lama was asked, is it true? And he became very quiet for a while and then he said, it's possible. And you know what has happened, China taking over many parts of Tibet and the whole framework of the Dalai Lama's place as a political leader has changed completely. It has lost relevance and it's to be seen. But the idea of a radical change. In the Christian mystical tradition, there's another prophecy which comes from one of the very old popes 500 years ago who was a visionary, who was a mystic. He foresaw the coming of, I think, 103 popes after him, describing each one in symbolic terms. And in his sequence, he said, the current pope will be the last, there will be no other. In Nostradamus prophecy, similarly, there's some sense of great transitions and changes. I'm not going into details because they don't matter. There were attempts by mystics to see far off into the future of the nature of a change which was inconceivable to the mind. And so they described it symbolically. What matters is we are in the thick of that change today. In the Indian tradition, it's the transition of one yuga into the next. Sri Aurobindo puts it in psychological terms. The age of reason ends. The spiritual age before it can begin, there is the subjective age and the passage in between. In which there is the false subjectivism of your ego and desire and the true subjectivism of the soul. And this is where we are at. And this is the choice that we have to make. And all those, as if prepared for this transition, which we are living today. So we are in the most precious, the most important, the most interesting times, spiritually also the most opportune. 
where Sri Aurobindo says, a little effort produces great results and changes destiny. Compared to other times when much labor goes to the making of a little result. And so every day matters, every step matters, every little effort matters and can make a huge difference. Let us meditate on this briefly before we disperse for lunch. <laughs>